Welcome back. Nigeria's gross domestic product has displayed some sign of resilience as the second quarter of the year are growing by 2.51% year-on-year in real terms. Uh, this growth, as reported by the National Bureau of Statistics, uh, represents a 0.2% increase from the previous quarter, but a 1.03% decline compared to the corresponding period of 2022. The service sector emerged as the primary driver of uh, the nation's uh, GDP uh, growth figures in the Q in Q2 2023, recording an impressive growth rate of 4.42%. Now, this sector contributed 58.42% uh, to the overall GDP, highlighting its significance in the country's economic landscape. The services sector robust uh, performance can be attributed to various factors, including increased uh, consumer spending, a rise in, tur in tourism, and the expansion of financial services. Now, this position uh, development, this positive development rather, have bolstered Nigeria's GDP and created employment opportunities. Bemi Longe is a development economist from uh, senior economic analyst from STAIRS is joining us uh, via Zoom. So good to have you on the program, Bemi. Thanks for having me. Uh, tell me, Bemi, when you saw the figures as released by the NBS, what ran through your mind? Would you be, could there be some sense of excitement or otherwise? Um, I guess expected. it was, it was, was expected. Um, so I, I definitely wasn't excited because um, Nigeria hasn't had significant growth. The size of, of Nigeria's economy and, and, and the level of development that it's, it's, it's at at the moment, Nigeria is expected to be doing north of 5% GDP growth. But Nigeria hasn't had more than 3% GDP growth in the last um since 20, 2015. So it's it's definitely very devastating still. However, um, we've seen the economy, um, I guess, perform, um, I guess, manageably in this in this in this Q2. What was very interesting though is just how the different sectors performed. Um as based on the result that we got, we saw that sectors like the ICT sector have surpassed um crude oil as the third largest sector in the economy. And that in itself is very encouraging. We saw sectors like the agri sector, although it's starting to lose its significance in its, in, 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 it's still the largest um, sector in Nigeria's GDP. However, it's shrinking in terms of the contribution to GDP. And um, even its performance was just around 2.2%, which is still very small. Um, so all, many of the we saw different sectors contract, sectors like um, road transportation, for instance, contracted by like 55%, which is a lot. And that can be attributed to the impact of the petrol subsidy removal. So there's just a few things here and there. Some sectors are contracting. However, there are still bright spots like the, the trade sector and um, um, the ICT sector that's still doing well. Fantastic. I'm, I'm happy you're beginning to look at the sectoral um a component of this of this report. Nineteen sectors were evaluated, but five of those sectors uh, did, um, you know, make up seventy two point three percent contribution to this GDP. Uh, what can you? What does this speak to you in terms of where? What our attention should be about as a country and as a nation? Um, I think again, I'll go back to the ICT sector because. The performance of the sector is very tremendous. We've seen since the early 2000s, we've seen the sector move from basically nothing um, to being the third largest sector in the economy. And it points to what can happen when the federal government allows, you know, provides an enabling environment for a sector and allows, like, do, does not attempt to interfere in the performance of that sector. So we've seen um, different, I mean, in, in, in the early 2000s, there was the liberalization of the telecommunication se sector, and we saw a lot of investors coming and putting their money. Now, the kind of services they're providing, there's, there's some sort of competition between the players. I mean, it's, it's still an oligopoly for the most part, which means that, 
there are just a few players and many buyers. Um, but then even within that, there's still some sort of competition. So these providers, these um, 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 mobile network operators, for instance, are constantly trying to innovate, constantly trying to improve their services. That's because, and this is without any form of favoritism in terms of like we see with different other sectors, like the agri sector, for instance, where the federal government has been for a long time protective over that sector. And we've seen the protectiveness come in terms of the federal government, you know, closing land borders, um, attempting to prevent importation of certain agri produce so that the um, local producers can, I guess, you know, exceed or uh, success, su um, succeed in producing their goods and services. However, the problem with that is it doesn't allow for competition. So we now go back to the IC sector where there's a lot of competition. Players are continuously trying to improve their services so that they can be better because there's a chance that, you know, Nigerians can hop off and go to um, another industry player. I mean, there's still room for competition there because barriers to entry in that sector is still pretty high. But given what we're seeing there, we can see that, you know, the competition between players is what is um, allowing for growth. And from 8%, I mean, as of 2018 or 2019, the ICT sector was still contributing 8% to GDP. And now it's contributing 16%. I mean, it's it's just seeing that growth is very encouraging so it just points to what the government can do this new administration what they should be doing this time is attempting not to really interfere in what is going on in different sectors i mean there's still some that require some sort of intervention in terms of like just providing funds but in the agri sector for instance the government goes uh, goes farther than just providing funds so actually providing like you know fertilizers and some other inputs for farmers so beyond just providing that kind of enabling environments and supports it's important for competition to thrive in sectors for them to grow and we're seeing that with the ICT sector hopefully we'll see with other sectors as well when you say uh, competition uh, what, what are you talking about here Com competition among players among um, uh, real sector players or is it about um, licensing uh, real sectors to be able to operate on a level playing field exactly what do you mean when you say competition so it would mean different things for different sectors. So um, I already spoke about the ICT sector there. It's just, you know, providing, allowing these um, players to basically um, provide services to, to customers and, you know, compete with one another in terms of the kinds of services they're providing. Um, to a large extent, they all are very comparable, but we've seen situations where players basically um, take up more market share than others. Um, I mean, we saw back back when MTN was, uh, MTN, you know, is I, I believe is still the largest um, share, it still manages the largest share of the telecommunications sector, but we've seen um, other players like, like Airtel and Nine Mobile basically take up, you know, more significant shares over the years and that kind of competition allows basically everyone to stand on their toes and ensure that they're providing the best services to their customers in sectors like agri it would look more like allowing for importation of goods and services now what this does for nigerians is that first it reduces the cost of even accessing food and it solves problems like um, food insecurity and all that but also allows nigerian farmers to become more competitive in terms of the kinds of produce and um, produce that they they um, 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 send out to the markets. So what I mean by that is ensuring that your goods are, you know, up to a certain type of quality. If not, you are sure that you know you won't be able to sell because um, 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 foreign goods will probably, you know, be be cheaper or be more accessible to people, be more preferable to people. So apart from that, it's like ensuring that you're providing very quality goods that you can only just sell within your country, but you can also export. And even beyond that, right, one big thing in the agri sector that we see is that um, cost of production is just high. So yeah. even you have a situation where even with the um, high cost of tariffs and all these protectionist policies that the government has put in place, people are still willing to take the extra mile to um, import uh, uh, goods from outside because at the end of the day, even with all these extra costs, sometimes it's still cheaper than buying locally. So it's ensuring that the government is providing the right kind of infrastructure, the right kind of support for farmers so that they're reducing their cost of production and ensuring that they're producing high quality goods that they will sell within Nigeria and also export outside of Nigeria. What, what do you think a lower cost of energy 
uh, can do to the economy uh, going forward. Yes, we did see transportation uh, contract in this latest figure, but what do you think a lower cost of energy can do or availability of, 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 of um, cheaper forms of energy? What can it do uh, to our economy? So by energy, I'm guessing you're referring to um, petrol. Or do you mean petrol or do you mean electricity? Because then it would mean different things. Um, I mean, both of them are all forms of energy, uh, which of course um, could um, springboard um, economic activities. Uh, petrol could also be a form of energy as well, some as electricity. So should we have a cheaper form of, of petrol? Or yes, a cheaper form of petrol as a form of energy. How, how do you think this could impact, impact um, the figures? Um, so as, as a macroeconomist, um, I do not think that Nigeria can afford cheaper energy right now, um, whether it's in terms of, because cheaper energy then means um, reinstating subsidies or finding ways, I mean, except we find um, other ways to get power, which, or I'm um, sorry, to get um, energy, which is very unlikely. So I don't think the problem really is the cost of it at I mean, today the, the problem is the cost because because the government has allowed or had allowed the subsidy to basically stay for a long time. Removing it had to be; it couldn't it, it couldn't be gradual. The government couldn't take a gradual move to remove it. Now, if we already had, I mean, one bigger problem that people face is the um, lack of. basically provide their, their own infrastructure, their own power, their own water, their own logistics, right? These are things that should be provided already. Now, if we have an uninterrupted, you know, source of power, for instance, then businesses do not have to have backups to backups to backups to their generators just because they want to keep the lights on, right? So we, I mean, I guess that's what we should be thinking about more, how to improve what is already available, not how to make it cheaper, because cheaper is not always better. In Nigeria's case, especially, cheaper always means inefficient. Cheaper means, I mean, in the electricity sector, one of the main big, one of the biggest reasons that we've been seeing or we've been hearing about um, um, that that's the main cause of inept electricity in Nigeria is the costs, right? Nigeria's electricity just became cost reflective. And even with the cost reflective electricity, there's still a lot of people that are unmetered. So metering is still a big issue, ensuring that there's access, that everyone is actually paying the value of electricity that they have access to is still a big problem in Nigeria. And with that happening, you know, distribution companies cannot get, get enough money to pay the transmission companies and the generation companies and all that. So it's just basically a value chain thing. I do not think that reducing the cost of anything at the moment might be the solution because all it just does is kick the can down the road. We have a situation where you make it cheaper for people today and then tomorrow it's, it's, it's still, it's still um, epileptic and then at the end of the day, you have to forcefully remove it at once and then you keep the economy in a, in, in a shock. You, you basically shock the economy the way we have it today um, in Nigeria. And we've seen this year with, with the twin reforms, you know, the petrol subsidy removal and the FX reforms at the same time. It's been a huge shock, but that's not something that we can reverse on right now because the country just cannot afford it. You know, these are uninteresting times for, for us as a people and as a country. Uh, Baby Sola. Uh, let's look at current realities and um, uh, current parameters. Uh, what would your expectation be for the next uh, um, GDP figures, your projection? Um, okay, um, I'm, I'm not going to give an actual um, number. However, um, given the impact of, I mean, we already saw the impact of the um, uh, subsidy removal on road transportation and other sectors like, um, I mean, so I expect that all the other policies like the FX reforms and even the, the first petrol subsidy removal still to have an impact on GDP a lot in, in Q3. I expect that, um, you know, because of that, sectors like road transportation that are already contracted might still contract some more. Sectors like manufacturing, which um, would already have faced a significant hike in the cost of production, would, would also contract as well as a result of you know, the petrol subsidy removal and the FX reforms. So they're just different. Um, I mean, agri sector, there isn't a lot going on there yet. The new administration hasn't exactly pumped in money into that sector. So it might still just remain within that the normal growth or it might even contract 
contracts as a result of just several other issues that are going on in that sector. Things like um, um, the, the insecurity issues, I mean, and amongst all the other structural issues that exist. So I think that there will still be a slow growth. Um, I'm not very optimistic. I believe that Q3 was when the impact of the petrol subsidy removal and FX reforms were really felt in the economy. So there might be a contraction. I'm, I'm leaning towards a, a contraction in Q3. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not looking very great for Nigeria. And going forward, because inflation is still high and we expect it to continue to increase till the end of the year, we still think that that would affect other sectors like trade or has other services sectors. And um, I mean, it doesn't look great for Nigeria, unfortunately. Wow, sad, sad, sad projection there coming from Gwemi Longe. She's not optimistic that um, uh, there could be a positive growth uh, by next quarters. Anyways, let's wait and see. You just maybe we I mean, could have sorry, some sorry, quick just fix in the transport end. sector. Sorry. Just mm -hmm. maybe we could have some quick fix in uh, the manufacturing sector. And just maybe, just maybe, you know, we'll probably get um, a positive um, growth as against um, the contraction that um, uh, you did predict. This, this day. Thank you so very much, Bumi Sola. Yes, I, I do believe, sorry, just to quickly add there, I do believe that there will be a positive growth, but it will just be lower than our Q2 numbers. It would be pretty low. Well, yeah. same thing, same thing you just said. You're expecting a, a, a reduction <laughs> in growth figures anyway. So whichever way you put it, it is still an expectation of a negative growth, uh, reduced growth rather. Thank you so very much, Bumi Sola. Always a pleasure talking to you on you uh, today's business. Do have a great day.